Okay, without further ado, we have our first academic master's finalist in music up. This is Charlie Jarvis from Grants Pass High School.
What an amazing job. Thank you, Charlie. Ladies and gentlemen, if you if you get a chance, and we may... Okay, and if you look up, we have we should have the prompt up here in a short minute. And our first English contestant is Aaron McLittle from North Valley High School. Okay, 
I would also like to thank our timers tonight. I have my athletic director and his lovely <laughs> wife, Bruce and Danielle Reese. Thank you for doing that. The next English contestant we have up is from Hidden Valley High School, Olali De Souza. Contestant is from the home team, Illinois Valley High School. This is Owen Dwyer. Hi, I'm Owen Dwyer. I'd just like to take a moment to thank the judges, the Academic Masters Foundation, and everyone who makes this possible. So, for my prompt of Cold Mountain. Um, I selected the one relating to Inman, the main, one of the main characters, Death, uh, which occurs near the end of the novel. Um, it asks about uh, why the author, Charles Frazier, decided to end with Inman's death, what he gains by doing this, or perhaps what he loses with this tragic ending. Uh, in this way, I feel that the author has made a very powerful choice by making one of the two main characters die in this, um, what some would say, very senseless way. Um, however, I feel that this is um, incredibly powerful as it carries both a stance of equality and redemption. Um, equality in that throughout this book, um, many characters die. They die nigh continually from uh, Ballas, a Greek translator on page 25, to Pangle, um, a a young, a young man who is uh, not one of uh, high intelligence on page 369, not even considering those later in the book that Inman has to kill. In this way, Inman dying is almost a justification of these deaths, in that not only people who are unimportant to the story die, uh, 
Just because he's avoided death for so long doesn't mean he cannot, that he can escape it forever. Truly, though, I feel that the greatest value gained by Inman's death is the redemption of his soul. Um, throughout much of the book, Inman views his soul as one thing that is uh, in great peril. Um, he worries quite a lot that he is permanently tainted by his experiences in uh, fighting at, for the Confederate side of the Civil War, and uh, he talks quite a bit about some of the terrible things that he's had to do and the way that he views himself tainted and perhaps permanently ruined by the things he's forced to do. However, he also views most people in the world as redeemable, and in many situations, even the most foul people, he will avoid killing. He, even with someone who turned him over to death, he simply goes and knocks out when he goes to retrieve the things that they have. Um, in the end, he is killed by a young boy named Birch, who is described with pure white hair and light blue eyes and an empty and empty eyes and an empty face. He is very much uh, described as though he is an old man in a young person's body, one whose soul has already been deeply tainted and damaged. Inman tries in the pages before his death to reason with the boy, asking uh, that they could uh, lay down his weapon simply so that Inman can go down the mountain without worrying about having a bead drawn on his head. To which the boy immediately replies, Oh, I'd be laying for you. I'd be laying. Truly reminding Inman that there's nothing he can do but kill this boy. However, when finally he's confronted face to face with the boy and his gun, he hesitates and asks him, asks him to put down the gun before being shot on Cold Mountain, the namesake of the book. In the end, Inman is unwilling to kill someone he sees as redeemable because he, his soul itself is still of value, however much he may worry about it. His death comes not because of the taint that he finds in his own soul, but because of the strength that is still in it, the power of his own morality that is keeping him from killing someone who he doesn't want to kill, someone that he views as redeemable and that there's been enough death in the world already. Thank you. Okay, before our next contestant comes up, we have, and that will be Jackson Johnson from Grants Pass. A little bit about Jackson. Um, activities that Jackson's been a part of, golf in ninth grade, National Honor Society, 10th through 12th grade, uh, the secretary for the National Honor Society at Grants Pass High School, and Jackson plans on studying psychology at BYU Provo. Um, if your life was made into a movie, what movie would it be and why? It would be the funniest movie ever. And it would star my doppelganger, Matthew McConaughey. So that's, I feel like that's a really good thing. So without further ado, here's Jackson Johnson from Grants Pass High School. He must struggle through mostly alone until he can be reunited with his long lost love. And while his relationship is somewhat changed along the way, it remains relatively similar throughout the entire book. Fraser takes this relationship that Inman has with Cold Mountain and uses it to show not only how unforgiving nature can be, but also how having that relationship with nature allows us to survive a little bit through the harshest of circumstances. After many days or weeks or months of traveling from, through the mountain range, Inman felt that the peaks now stood higher than the veils, now stood higher and the veils deeper than they did in truth. 
He had been alone for so long that he could be described as an animal. However, he learned to rely on Cold Mountain as it provided him with an assortment of wildlife and plants to eat, and it somewhat allowed him to shelter occasionally. However, he was under constant threat. The home guard after him for abandoning the war, or maybe a man he had offended attempting to kill him, he only needed to turn to Cold Mountain and run to survive. Being in that seemingly constant pursuit, he expressed his feelings in the end that the world was such a lonely, like, such an incredibly lonely place. He had been through so much, and he had lost all resemblance of the man that he had once been by the end. His face drawn and hollow, above his beard, with black eyes, his they shone. Yes, his face drawn and hollow, cheeked above his beard, and with black eyes shining deep in their sockets. The mountain was definitely no easy place to be. And he did find companionship along the way with a few people um, that took him in and helped him or, refu or refused to leave him alone. However, what Inman does is much more than that. By the end, he makes it through the mountain, and he finds the woman that he loves. And it allows him to have a deeper appreciation for the time that he is granted with this woman, even though it is like three days before he dies. But the man that went into the mountain and the man that came out of the mountain were not the same. He went in and the creature that left had learned quickly of the brutality and loneliness that resided in those peaks with him. And in the end he felt that the relationship with the mountain allowed him for that greater appreciation for that little time. And ultimately, it allows us to understand that yes, we are going to be put through harsh circumstances in unfamiliar places that we are going to have to travel at some point, like Inman did. And while we might not be under constant threat from the home guard trying to take us after escaping the war, or another man that we might have insulted that is now trying to kill us, there will be those times that we feel incredibly alone, and maybe the only, time, the only place we can escape from those times is through nature. And Inman's connection with nature, it allows us to understand just how important that connection can be because without it, there is no doubt that he would not have been able to survive. After he found the woman that he loved, Ada, he sent her along and a few hours later <coughs> died along his way to be back with her. Shot by the home guard for abandoning the war, I suppose. And ultimately, it, allowed us, it allows us to understand just how much that mountain can mean to us because all of us will face these mountains, and all of us will have to attempt to overcome them. And it, will, and it should, hopefully, allow all of us to have a greater appreciation for what it is that we have and what it is that we've been through. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Annie Hurtler. I just wanted to say welcome to everyone who came to Illinois Valley for the academic masters and today I will be singing for you Bistu by Mir, arrangement by Bach.
Thank you very much, Annie. I enjoy listening to people sing because I'm so bad in church, they ask me to be quiet. I just stand there and open my mouth. So we will jump from music again back into social studies. Our first contestant in social studies will be from Grants Pass High School, Kelly Bell. And uh, I appreciate the sense of humor. One of the questions that was asked um, says, if you could, how, how would you change the world? And I was probably typing the question because it says, the answer says, I would fix this question for grammar. So touche, I thought that was funny. Um, future plans for Kelly is to attend George Fox University, double major in history and politics, um, and then begin teaching history at the high school level. I think um, after we're done watching this, we would probably all hire him, all the high school principals in the room. So I still have time, all right. This is different than home, people listen to me right now, so at home that doesn't happen. The judges for social studies are, are again from Rogue Community College faculty, and we have Nikki Coulter and Manny Pacheco. If we could give them a round of applause. All right. We're counting on you, Manny, then, if, you're, if it's only you. <laughs> you can break all the ties. Well, good evening. Thank you all for being here. Uh, once again, I am Kelly Bell. And uh, I would like to jump right into tonight's topic. Uh, we're going to be talking about General George Washington, the Continental Army, and some of the struggles that, uh, that they faced. First, I'd like to talk about General George Washington and um, the fact that he was a unique pick for the position of the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, primarily because he had different objectives or um, priorities than other contemporary generals at this time. One of his, um, I'm sorry, he didn't prioritize winning battles. Um, and I don't say that to be mean, I don't say it to be funny. I say it because it was true. Instead of winning, uh, Washington would choose to retreat, to pull back, and by doing so, he could retreat yet another day during another battle. Um, Washington believed that he could beat the English through a war of attrition, so therefore his very survival was an insult to them. By continuing to retreat, he would exhaust their resources and eventually he planned to win the war this way. However, Washington soon found that his main competitor was not the English, but it was in fact the diseases that was plaguing his army. During the Revolutionary War, 90% of all the casualties that Washington suffered were caused, or sorry, inflicted, by diseases such as smallpox, also known as Valeria Major, or Variola Major, apologies. Uh, additionally, dysentery, which is uh, any form of a disease relating to diarrhea, also plagued his troops. Typhus and typhoid also played a very rampant role amongst his men in his camps. So after Washington had identified that these were the issues, he set about to rectify them. And by doing so, he had a twofold plan. One, change the troops, change the camp. That was his first step. Two, to inoculate everyone against the smallpox virus. So the way he went about first changing the camp was he used this man here, Nathaniel Green. Those are not his real eyes. <laughs> and he would use Nathaniel Green, who was a young up and coming general in Washington's army, and he used him and his uh, organization skills to adjust the camp at Valley Forge. During Valley Forge, Washington spent six months in the winter of Philadelphia, I'm sorry, in a Philadelphia winter, sitting there, cold, hungry, and all of his troops were infected with smallpox. Nathaniel Green's revolutionary idea was to separate the kitchen and the bathroom, therefore present, preventing any men from contaminating their food or water supply. In addition to this, uh, General Washington also employed Baron Friedman von Steuben, who was a a professional soldier during the Seven Years' War for the Prussian military. Um, his main role for the Continental Army was to train them, drill them, teach them, and overall discipline them. So now, instead of each soldier going a full month or six months without ever changing his shirt, now each soldier changed his clothes, washed himself, washed his clothes, and cleaned his utensils, therefore increasing the hygiene and lowering the risk of disease. Additionally, Washington made the ultimate decision. He chose mass inoculation. 
Now, really quickly, the inoculation process is highly dangerous, which is why Washington himself, along with the Continental Congress, had decided to outlaw it, because they believed by inoculating troops, by infecting them with the smallpox virus, they would eventually be able to spread it to other people and then potentially lose the war because they had no army to fight with. Washington's bold decision ultimately paid off after he had successfully inoculated 40,000 troops in one year, each taking a, a rotation of about 2,000 men at a time, severely limiting his resources and his force. His infection rate from smallpox dropped from 19% down to 1%. This bold decision, okay, this is when Washington crosses the Rubicon. That's a famous saying relating to Gaius, Claudius, Julius Caesar, but this painting is actually of him crossing the Delaware. Instead, Washington crossed the Rubicon when he chose to inoculate his troops. Once he had crossed over that bridge, once he had crossed that river, there was no turning back for him. It was because of his bold decision that we now revere him as one of our greatest military strategists and one of our greatest presidents of all time. Thank you. Outstanding job there by Kelly, especially with the uh, technology gaff. So he could work here because technology doesn't work at this high school all the time. And then he's very <laughs> smart, so he's got a job waiting for him here. Uh, our next contestant is Eric Whitmore from North Valley High School. Eric's future plans are to attend Oregon State University in Corvallis. Go Beeves. Um, and he is on the clock. Coming up. Things like that, 
And over to, and during the early years of the war, this was a huge problem for the Americans because they were on the defense most of the time. And this would come, and this would come to a head at the winter at Valley Forge, which would be ultimately uh, the darkest period for the for the Continental Army. At this point, they had to winter for about six months, and this. This winter was spent in an incredibly cold environment, which would cause common colds, which would weaken their immune system. Uh, the cold would require them to have to uh, share blankets and the like, because they didn't have the supplies for each and every person to have their own blankets and clothing and the like. And this would eventually, and this would eventually cause uh, dysentery and smallpox to, to um, infect them very rapidly. So. George Washington is actually the first person in military history, or at least in recorded military history, to uh, attempt inoculation of a, a military camp. Now, typically at the time, inoculations were done by cutting someone's arm open and exposing blood of an infected person into the uh, regular blood of the infected person onto the uh, cut. Uh, this is typically it's more uh, it's more perfected nowadays, but that's the basics of how a vaccine works nowadays. Uh, this was relatively effective, however, uh, this was relatively effective, however, uh, dysentery really could not be, really could not be thwarted as that would require uh, sewage, uh, active sewage systems, which wouldn't happen, which wouldn't occur until uh, the late 19th century. However, ultimately the upswing in living conditions would be when the French intervened on behalf of the um, American of the Americans, they would they would be given new uniforms and they would be given new uniforms, more food to keep their immune system up, and more importantly, they were able to continuously they were now able to be on the offensive and continuously move. You know, uh, an infect, infected water sources is a major problem only when only when you have to stay there for six months. Uh, as they began to go on the offensive, they could, they could now move before it became a serious problem. Ladies and gentlemen, our next contestant is Joseph Gerson from Hidden Valley High School. Joseph's future plans include going to OIT to study medicine. Please give a round of applause for Joseph. of casualties, but during the, U the U.S. War uh, of Independence, disease and uh, infection proved to be a bigger force against the Patriots instead of the British that opposed them. The Continental Army was derived from rural isolated areas and colonies, so they had not previously been exposed to uh, smallpox. Smallpox was the biggest killer of American forces. One out of three who contracted it died. Uh, they would form uh, horrible rashes and scabs, and some even went blind. Dysentery was the second for colonists in general. It was usually caused by poor hygiene, but it was also communicable. Most people died from dehydration. Many problems ar ar arose from, the, from diseases. It diminished military power by killing or incapacitating, incapacitating troops, and more people died from disease than fighting, in fact. A lamenting John Adams quoted that, uh, the smallpox is 10 times more terrible than Britons, Canadians, and Indians combined. An estimated 17,000 Americans died from disease compared to 
the recorded 4,435 military deaths. During the encampment at Valley Forge, one out of six soldiers succumbed to disease, and 1,000 were deemed too ill for war. Massive infections led to battle delays and periods of weakness, which threatened indep the independence movement as a whole from British attacks. Morale crumbled under the threat of disease, war, and undesirable camp conditions. This led to de the desertion and retirement of previous soldiers, and this decreased enlistments horrendously out of fear for war, death, and disease. Washington tried to contain outbreaks as best as he could. Illness was usually caused in encampments by poor hygiene practices. They didn't remove dead animal carcasses that were just rotting there. They did not use latrines and uh, relieve themselves wherever. They were forced to be in cramped spaces. They were in damp weather, poor clothing, and starvation made it a breeding ground for infection. George Washington was infuriated with the behavior of the soldiers, and, they, and he ordered soldiers to go to the bathroom properly and burn all the animal corpses. He also made them sweep the roads, barracks, and quarters daily. These orders would have helped prevent disease, especially bacterial infections such as, such as typhoid and dysentery, if not for the cramped, stuffy huts that 12 men had to share. Smallpox was a long-standing uh, threat to George Washington. At the Siege of Boston, at the inception of the war, uh, after the British had uh, evacuated from it, George Washington considered inoculation, but inoculation was considered controversial in the colonies. Some even outlawed them. George Washington eventually decided against it, to prevent an outbreak among troops. Instead, he followed regular protocol of quarantine, but, but smallpox, smallpox spread to other cities anyway. Because of the losses, Washington changed his medical policy. Uh, in 1777, he ordered all soldiers to be inoculated. In his quote to defend his action, he said, it is necessity not, only, necessity not only authorizes, but seems to require the measure, for should the disorder infect that army in the natural way and rage with its usual virulence, we should dread more from it than from the sword of the enemy. The, inoc the inoculations were a huge success. Only 1% died, and most were then immune to smallpox. At Valley Forge, another smallpox outbreak uh, well, broke out and uh, he once again chose to inoculate the soldiers, which resulted in triumph. General Washington's military genius is undisputed, but it overshadows what truly saved the Continental Army, his unorthodox medical actions. With a trained and rejuvenated army, the colonies defeated the British and founded the United States of America. We have one more, and then we're going to take a quick five-minute intermission. The last participant in social studies is Jonathan Wood from Illinois Valley High School. Jonathan has participated in basketball, soccer, football, and the Knowledge Bowl. Everybody, Mr. Jonathan Wood. Disease is nowhere more evident 
than in the American Revolutionary War. This bloody conflict saw the American colonies fighting for liberty against the, all, the now waning British Empire. But it was much more than that. It was a war of attrition. It was a war of survival. As disease ravaged through, the leaders and great warriors of their time had a new enemy to face. One that could not be destroyed with the blades, of, the blades that they had so often used. The bloody conflict saw, the bloody conflict saw more than 25,000 to 75,000 deaths just to the American side. Yet strangely enough, only 6,800 of them actually died due to war or in war. Three times as many died to the commander of death, to disease. Similar numbers of soldiers from the British, from the British side and countless other civilians died to his wrath. War meant soldiers from Britain and her allies began amassing and crossing the Atlantic. This also became the perfect breeding ground for disease. On these ships, 18 and a half thousand men boarded and did not cross the Atlantic successfully, lying in their final barrier place at the bottom of the sea. Disease had truly taken its toll and destroyed much of the British Empire before the Americans ever had a whack at them. During this heat of war, George Washington finding out about these unseen killers, decided that it must be a act upon. He himself was a, small pox, was a smallpox survivor. He had faced the disease when he was but 19. And, but this time, failure did not only mean the loss of his life. It meant possible loss of thousands of soldiers and civilians. He wrote to Congress once, saying that this disease is greater than the swords of the enemies. Yet he also assured the Continental Congress that he would be attentive to the smallest signs of the smallpox. And he did. He immediately began quarantining anyone he even suspected contained the disease. He acted quickly and fast, hoping to beat the smallpox and dysentery before they could actually affect his soldiers. Yet he was fighting a losing battle. Despite the fact that smallpox only spreads through human contact, through bodily fluids, it had found a new way, possibly riding on, on human feces, possibly riding on much other things. The smallpox had managed to get its way into the waterways, to the very source that caused human life now threatened it. And the British, when they had taken Boston, and the Boston refugees began to flood to the Continental Army for support, the British purposely let out certain individuals that they deemed potentially had the smallpox in an attempt to attack the um, American army in a sort of chemical warfare. Now, George Washington, learning of these efforts, had to face with the inevitability that he had to turn away the refugees in an attempt to protect his own army. But in the end, his army began to fall into ruin. The smallpox began to ravage at it, and he had to find a more radical solution. In 1776, he devised a plan. He himself, already suffering through smallpox, determined that possibly the cause of the cause of the disease could be prevented by already being exposed to it. He himself had survived it, and he did not. He was not affected by the spread of the disease. So he decided to purposefully set smallpox out in the camp. He ordered each man to cut a slit into his arm, and then he had doctors take. Um, small quantities of the disease from already infected victims and insert it into the wound. In this way, he pioneered modern vaccination. He inoculated much of his army. Despite the fact that they were down for multiple month, for about a month, it was in the dead of winter, and strike by the British was most you know, un, unaccounted for. In this way, George Washington fought the unseen killers. We ourselves fight these unseen killers in similar ways. But George Washington indeed did a lot to prevent the spread of smallpox, and we owe him a debt. Thank you. Okay, we are going to take a five minute intermission. Thank you for being such a great audience so far. Okay, thank you and I apologize for the short intermission. We want to be
cognizant of everyone's time. Thank you again to our music judges, who are by far our most versatile judges because they've got to go up and back a bunch of times. So, uh, Brian Jeffs and Kelly Moody, thank you again for being here. Our next contestant is in the music category from Hidden Valley High School, Grace Henry. Grace is a member of the high school soccer team and the band. She plans on attending college in Idaho and will study music or uh, something in the English profession. Ladies and gentlemen, Grace Henry.
Outstanding job by Grace. Thank you, Grace. We will now move into the portion of the evening that uh, maybe I'm the only one, but a few of us may not understand a whole lot, and that is the math portion. So we have the, uh, the way that this will work is the students will bring the prompt up so they will explain the problem that they're solving to you. And our first math contestant is the president of the class of 2020 here at Illinois Valley High School, Ms. Raina Fusen. At this time, I'd like to announce our math judges. We have Elijah Bunnell, Mary Middleton, and Tracy Red. Thank you for being here. Our next contestant in math is from Grants Pass High School, Lucas Simchuk. Lucas's future plans are to study computer science at Case Western Reserve University and later become a software developer. Ladies and gentlemen, Lucas Simchuk.
All right, so for this problem, we had a square that was divided um, by four each time, um, and kind of the sequence. So um, the general pattern is that um, the, the former square is going to be four times as large as the latter square. So this is a common ratio of four to one, and basically you get um, a smaller square each time and this is known as a geometric sequence. You have a common ratio. And so, mathematically, the sequence is represented as a to the n is equal to one fourth to the power of n. And so for the next part, I was tasked with finding the 10th squared in the sequence. And so basically, I took my um, sequence equation. I just plugged in 10, index 10. And the area I found was 9.537 times 10 to the negative 7 units squared. And so summing up a sequence is known as a series. And so the sum from 1 to infinity is going to be finite here because by using um, a test known as the ratio test, we can determine that because the factor is only one fourth, which is less than one, um, the series will converge at infinity. And so when you keep adding one fourth, one sixteenth, one sixty fourth, um, one over two fifty six, you're gonna get zero at infinity. And so you'll just be adding zero. And so they'll be finite. If the ratio was one or more than one, you would get a divergent series, which would give you infinity at infinity. And so for the next part, I was tasked with summing up this convergent series. And so by simply using the equation, um, the first term in the sequence divided by one minus the common ratio, I could get the sum at infinity. And so the first area is just gonna be one fourth. And then you can just divide that by one minus r. And then if I just plug in that in the calculator, you just get exactly one third. So that will be the sum of all the shaded areas at infinity. Thank you. Our next contestant for math is from North Valley High School, Owen Pickering. Owen's future plans include going into a profession that includes engineering, programming, or physics at the atomic level. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Owen Pickering. second square is going to be a uh, fourth of the fourth because this is a quarter of the whole square and it's a quarter of the quarter. So that's going to be one fourth times one fourth if you want to put it into a fraction form, which is going to give us one sixteenth. So now we have a fourth of a sixteenth right here. So that's one sixteenth times one fourth and we're going to get one sixty fourth. And that's what I have right here. I went through ahead and did a four as well. And when you start looking at this, you start to kind of realize a little bit of a pattern. It seems to be 1 over 4 to the something power, since 4 is 4 to the first power, 16 is 4 to the second power, 64 is 4 to the third power, and 256 is 4 to the fourth power. So with that, we can figure out an equation um, to use to help us calculate these a little bit more easier and not have a strenuous uh, uh, process of just going 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, which gets pretty boring after a while. 
believe me, I know from experience. <laughs> so with that, we can get this equation. A n equals 1 over 4 to the nth power, which is basically saying, so this is a1, this is a2, this is a3, and so on. So a whatever number equals 1 over 4 to that number's power. So with this, we were asked to um, figure out what a to the a10 is. So instead of using the calculator, what I decided to do is I decided to go a10 is equal to 1 over 4 to the 10th power, or a10 is equal to 1 over uh, 1,048,576, which is quite a large number, and also would have hit, taken me about four times hitting four in the times button. So next up, we have to um, see if it's finite or infinite. And this is an infinite space. And the reason for this is if we take a kind of a mock diagram of this, right here, you can see that we have like a nice square. It's kind of a little bit badly drawn, but it kind of gives the uh, process, right? So what we're going to look at is it goes down, but this gets pretty small right here. So how about we look at that a little bit larger up? It looks like the same thing, but it also gets small down here as well. So why don't we larger that one up as well? And repeat and repeat. Basically, since there's space to quarter, you can always quarter more space. If I have a cake, I can always take half of the cake, even if half of it gets gone. So I can take half the cake, take another quarter of the cake, and all but that's technically half of the half. And it just kind of goes on. I can always take cake, because there always will be cake left. I'm never taking all the cake. So after you get all these numbers, you get a ton of list of numbers, you kind of just look at it, you're like, OK. So if it's infinite, then how can there be a reasonable way to figure out the exact number? Because you can't. It's infinite. However, you can, because fractions exist, and they are amazing. <laughs> So some fractions don't terminate, such as 1 over 3. So the answer to this is uh, the exact number of the area is going to be 1, 1 over 3rd, or 4 thirds, if you want to do that type of fraction. And the reason for this is if you go ahead and you add up all the numbers, you get 1 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 16th plus 1 64th, and so on and so forth, on and on and on, you eventually start seeing that it kind of deadlocks at 3. And this makes sense because as you go smaller in the fractions, they can't really hit the bigger uh, dividends, not dividends, digits as much. Um, so like the tenth place in the decimals, well sometimes some of these, like uh, A10, it doesn't even get up to the thousandth place. So it can't really affect the tenth place and it starts getting locked into place. And you look at this pattern and you start getting 1.3333333 or 1 and 1 third. So yeah. Our final contestant for math is from Hidden Valley High School, Daniel Beachy, and if he had to live on a deserted island and could take only two people with him, he would take Bear Grylls to keep him alive, and his mother to cook when he's tired of eating insects. <laughs> he scores points with mom there. So, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Daniel Beachy. you guys for the fourth time. Um, so, so we have a one by one square, which is, uh, it's a fractal. So it's divided into four parts. Um, these four parts, the bottom left corner is shaded, and then the top right corner is divided into four more parts where the process continues. The bottom left corner is shaded, the bottom right, or the top right corner is divided into four parts again. So this will continue on for infinity. You can, um, this very, very top right corner you can see, um, but it doesn't actually capture the how far it goes. It goes to infinity, it gets infinitely small. So that's a fractal, and we have four questions to answer about this fractal. So the first question is, what is, or find the area of the first few shaded regions and is there a pattern? So, 
We can find the first area by finding, so we know the area of the overall square is one by one, which means it's a one, uh, the area is one. So all we have to do is multiply that one by one fourth to find the area. So the area of the first shaded region, this shaded region is one fourth. To find the area of the second shaded region, we have a one fourth by one fourth square, which is one fourth. Um, the area of the whole square is one fourth. And we have one fourth of that square, which means it's just one fourth times one fourth, which is one sixteenth. For the third one, we can do it again. We have a one sixteenth by one sixteenth square, and we multiply that by one fourth, we get one sixty fourth. So the pattern that we see that emerges here is that all of these uh, areas are powers of one fourth. So the first area is one fourth, which, which is one fourth to the first power. The second area is one fourth to the second power, which is one sixteenth. And the third area is one fourth to the third power, which is one sixty fourth. So that's the pattern. Um, every area is the power, uh, is a power of one fourth. The second question we're asked is. What is the area of the 10th shaded region? So going off what we learned in the previous question, we know that the area of the 10th square is just 1 fourth to the 10th power. And in that case, it comes up to a number that is 1 over 1,048,576. And that number is very small. Um, and as we continue out to infinity, you'll see that the number gets extremely small. Um, as we go on. So the, that's the area of the 10th square, or the 10th shaded region. Um, our third question is, is, if we add up all of these shaded regions, is the result a finite or an infinite number? Um, and at first it might seem like it would be an infinite number, because these shaded regions go on for, forever, They're, they go on to an infinite number, so you would think that um, the resulting number would be an infinite number. However, that's not the case. Um, it is actually a finite number, and that is because um, these shaded regions get infinitely small as we add them up. So, for example, the 100th shaded region, a to the 100, or a sub 100, is one fourth to the 100th power, which is an extremely small number. It's 1.6 times 10 to the negative 60th, which is 1.6 followed by um, or it's 0.16 followed by 58 zeros, which is a very, very small number. So as we continue to add these um, up, it's not making a big difference on it, and it's never uh, increasing past, or it's never increasing past one-third. Um, so it's not going to infinity, it actually stops at one-third, which is the, the fourth question, which is what is the exact area of the shaded region? Um, and so, the answer is one-third, and that is because um, as you add up all of these shaded regions, the, the area will never exceed one-third. So, try to set up an example here. We have, oh, one-third, if we find one-fourth of that, we make a mark there, then we add one-sixteenth, we add one-sixty-fourth, we keep adding this, but we're never going to pass one-third. Um, so the answer to the area of all shaded regions is one third, and that's all I have for you. Thank you to our math judges, as that concludes the math portion. We will now jump back to music for the last time. And our last music contestant is from North Valley High School, Caitlin Nguyen. Caitlin's future plans are to, to attend the U University of Oregon.
Judges from Rogue Community College once again are Katie Strong and Dorothy Swain. Please give them a round of applause. (laughs) 
And if you look up at the screen right now with a telescope from where you're sitting, you might be able to see the science prompts, and I apologize about that. The first science contestant is from Hidden Valley High School, Aria Back. She is the, she will be the Hidden Valley valedictorian this year. And if her life was made into a movie, it, she chose the Disney movie Brave because the main character's got red hair and she's independent, which is exactly right. So everyone, Miss Aria Back. vitamins have attracted people. More than a hundred years ago, people who suffer from debilitating diseases such as scurvy and rickets were naturally cured by adding a key nutrient to their diet. It wasn't enough to have adequate food to eat anymore. Diets now had to be the right mix of foods that contained these seemingly miracle nutrients. In the United States, nearly half the adult population takes some form of multivitamin or mineral supplement, and annual sales of supplements approach nearly $30 billion annually. Vitamins are essential micronutrients required by the body in small amounts to support a range of vital functions. This can vary from maintaining teeth, bones, and skin to supporting the metabolism. There are currently 13 recognized vitamins are, are which are divided into two groups, water-soluble, which includes B-complex and C vitamins, and fat-soluble, A, D, E, and K. Unlike water-soluble vitamins that need regular replacement in the body, fat-soluble vitamins are stored in the liver and fatty tissues and are eliminated much slower. The body cannot store water-soluble vitamins, and they are soon excreted in urine. Because of this, water-soluble vitamins need to be replaced more often than fat-soluble ones. Although both vitamins and minerals are all considered micronutrients, vitamins and minerals differ in basic ways. Vitamins are organic and can be broken down by heat, air, or acid. Minerals are inorganic and hold on to their chemical structure. So why is this important? It means the minerals in soil and water easily find their way into your body through the plants, fish, animals, and fluids you consume. But it's tougher to shuttle vitamins from food and other sources into your body because cooking, storage, and simple exposure to air can inactivate these more fragile compounds. While minerals are hardy enough to enter your body without much difficulty, preserving vitamins in food can sometimes be more challenging, especially if you aren't eating enough vitamin-rich foods to provide them. This is how vitamin deficiencies can occur. The controversy over vitamin and mineral supplements recently brought to light is in part regarding the safety of taking them. In a recent Australian nutrition study, researchers considered whether or not taking vitamins was as beneficial as many believe it to be. The study was a systematic review testing the four common supplements of multivitamins, vitamin D, calcium, and vitamin C, where there was no reduction in incidence of heart disease, stroke, or premature death. This means there was no harm from taking them, but also no benefit. The second study tested these taking folic acid supplements, another water-soluble vitamin. While a small benefit for taking folic acid was found, researchers also found some adverse effects from supplementation. Among those taking statin medication to lower blood cholesterol, slow-release vitamin B3, or niacin, increased the risk of early death by up to 10%. On the other hand, the CDC strongly encourages pregnant women to take folic acid supplements as they have been proven to reduce the risk of birth defects in newborns. So, in reality, is it truly necessary to take vitamin supplements? The answer is both yes and no, depending on who you are. If you eat a healthy, balanced diet, you're probably getting all the vitamins you need for your body to function properly. If someone is pregnant or has a diagnosed deficiency, it may be helpful to supplement their diet. If most people don't really need to take vitamins with proper diet, why do we seemingly hear so much about them in the news and media? Some of this may go back to when society was first introduced to them. When Sir Edward Mellonby discovered the cure for rickets by simply adding cod liver oil to a patient's oatmeal, it was a breakthrough. Soon enough, companies began producing bottled vitamin D, and they were selling like crazy because of this new phenomenon that was curing a previously incurable disease. Ever since then, big businesses have marketed daily multivitamins in very similar ways. To prevent the risk of disease, yes, but also in some cases as a cure-all for whatever ails you. However, medical research does not seem to find any benefit in taking daily vitamin supplements. Daily multivitamins in chewable or gummy form especially contain more sugar than anything else. According to the federal government's dietary guidelines for Americans, nutritional needs are met primarily through foods. 
Foods in nutrient-dense forms contain essential vitamins that may have positive health effects. But only in some cases do fortified foods and dietary supplements prove useful in providing nutrients that would otherwise be consumed in less than recommended amounts. The bottom line with vitamins comes down to that infamous phrase that we all love to hear. Talk to your doctor. Because it is scientifically proven that vitamin supplements have the potential to be beneficial in certain cases, but taking vitamins when your body, when your body already has enough of the micronutrients it needs to function properly, it can be as simple as that. Too much of a good thing. Thank you. Our next science competitor is from Illinois Valley High School, Ms. Danny Scheinrock. She is the current National Honor Society President at, uh, at Vice President at Illinois Valley High School. And if she was to live on a deserted island and could only take two people, she would take Chuck Norris and Brian May. They wouldn't be stuck there too long, and Chuck could fight all the wild animals. That makes sense. All right, Miss Danny Scheinrock. Shinerock from Illinois Valley, and he'll be competing in science. So I will be addressing the number B, um, vitamins are coenzymes. What is a coenzyme, and why are vitamins important for human health? So how many of you remember those Flintstones gummies that your mother would give you? Whether you knew it or not, that was actually a concoction of vegetables and other parts of a complete diet. So, vitamins and minerals are generally found in foods, plants, nuts, meat, fish, and the like. Um, these, these are absolutely essential for normic, normic, normal physiological function. Um, vitamins are organic compounds, meaning that their nutritional value can be lost in storage, cooking, simply exposure to air and other environments due to the reactions that they will have in Earth's environment. So, along with vitamins comes micronutrients. These um, are absolutely essential for basic human functions such as digestion or the recreation of new cells, such as skin cells. Um, they also allow vitamins to take part in reactions inside of your body that sustain you, essentially. So some major micronutrients are iron, copper, zinc, magnesium, and fluoride. So onto this, vitamins are coenzymes. Enzymes speed up biological and physiological processes by changing or lowering the requirements for, for a chemical reaction. Coenzymes are a part of this process and are sometimes even more necessary than the first enzyme involved for particular reactions. So this nutritional breakdown is vital to human health for the following reasons. Without vitamins, illness is basically a guarantee. This can be in the form of scurvy, rickets, heart disease, or any other form of physical ail or cognitive ailment that you can think of. Um, without vitamins, the, the human body cannot grow or maintain itself. For example, Vitamins K, A, and D are absolutely necessary for bones and muscles to build or replenish themselves. Um, and if these vitamins are absent, children simply cannot grow. They will be halted and eventually wither away and die. So, vitamins are essential. Folic acid is another example of an essential vitamin. Um, without folic acid, in young women, neural tubes can develop um, weaknesses which can in turn cause birth defects in children. And the most common, commonly known of examples, um, nutrients found in fish, nuts, certain greens, are absolutely essential for brain development. So, another reason that nutrients are so important is to avoid deficiencies. Um, nutrient 
and vitamin deficiencies can cause an absolute loss of functionality of the human body. This can vary from a simple vitamin B1 deficiency, which can cause a slight sensation of hot toes, to a very common iron deficiency, which we associate with um, nausea, um, lightheadedness, sleepiness, all the way to a vitamin B6 deficiency, which can cause permanent and excruciatingly painful neurological damage. So, um, for overall health and longevity, vitamins are absolutely essential. In a 12-year in a men's health study, um, men with vitamin-rich diets were found to have a reduced risk of heart disease, cancers, loss of cognition, and um, other ailments than men who did not have a well-rounded diet in the form of um, vitamins. This does not encompass um, dietary supplements or multivitamins. So, scientists and nutritionists agree that a well-rounded, vitamin-rich diet in the form of food is the best way to live a long and healthy life, and without such, a person is doomed to unwellness. Next competitor in science is from Grants Pass High School. This is Mark Smolinski. Mark's future plans are to attend Harvard University. Uh, he applied and was accepted for mechanical engineering, but may change majors. So everyone, this is Mark Smolinski. So we all hear about the importance of vitamins all the time, but what exactly are vitamins? And does it really matter if I have enough? What happens if I don't have enough? These are all some of life's biggest questions that I'm sure you wonder all the time, like I used to. Shortly, I will be answering uh, prompt C, which diseases result from specific vitamin deficiencies, and and then I will first give some background info. So what a vitamin is, is a micronutrient that the human body can't produce uh, with the exception of vitamin D. So a micronutrient means it's needed in very small amounts uh, compared to like proteins or carbs. And the USDA has certain recommended daily amounts that should be met. If too much or too little is consumed, that can be bad for the body. Too much can lead to toxicity, and too little can mean certain diseases. So the disease you've probably all heard about is scurvy, which results from a vitamin D, a vitamin C deficiency. Uh, maybe you've heard sailors get this, and they ate lemons and limes to cure it. Uh, this is true, but it can also happen on dry land from people who don't have enough access to fresh foods. So what's vitamin C got to do with it? Vitamin C is a coenzyme in the body which helps the production of collagen. Collagen plays a big role in the structure of connective tissue in bones, muscles, tendons, and ligaments. It helps keep your teeth and gums strong. Uh, so when you get scurvy, all of this is weaker. And this is why the stereotypical image of a pirate is one who's missing teeth and has bad skin. Um, so if you have scurvy, or most other vitamin deficiencies, an easy solution is to change your diet. Um, for those with scurvy, like a sailor, a solution is to eat more fruit, which contain vitamin C. Another disease that stems from vitamin deficiency is called rickets. This comes from a deficiency of vitamin D. What vitamin D does is help the body with bone growth, bone growth and calcium absorption. Rickets can especially affect newborns um, because it affects, it makes your skeleton grow abnormally. Vitamin D is less common in food than other vitamins and 
the body produces it when skin is exposed to sunlight. So this can affect certain people more than others, like those who have to stay inside a lot, like the elderly or newborns, those who live at certain latitudes during a certain time of year, or dark-skinned people. Um, because these factors can't be controlled, the solution is to take a supplement. Another disease is called beriberi. This disease was used to be common among Japanese sailors and stemmed from a lack of vitamin B12. Um, but vitamin B12 uh, it helps uh, with the production of red blood cells. So this can make people anemic. So this can help with a change of diet as well. So, uh, just some more information on supplements. Um, since I mentioned it as a solution, the people who need it the most would be uh, pregnant women, newborns, the elderly, and vegans. Because um, in pregnant women, certain vitamins like uh, vitamin, uh, well, certain vitamins can help with the stimulation of cell growth and. Uh, lacking the vitamins can, I think it was lacking vitamin C, can help actually cause birth defects in the child. And then newborns also need a supplement in vitamin K, which helps uh, prevent blood clots and helps bone growth as well. And the elderly also need supplements in vitamin K to prevent bone fractures in the future. Uh, thank you. And our last science competitor, but definitely not the least, from North Valley High School, is Chris DeLong, who after high school would like to go to MIT and work on getting a degree in biomechanical engineering and possibly start his own business. Ladies and gentlemen from North Valley High School, Chris DeLong. TED Talk. Today I'm going to be discussing uh, vitamins, in, in particular vitamin E. So the prompt I was given was to talk about my uh, favorite vitamin, basically. And so I have some note cards here that I prepared, and hopefully they will help me in talking about it. So vitamin E is really interesting. The main thing I found interesting about it is that um, one of the main features of it is it inhibits cell proliferation. So basically it stops your cells from multiplying rapidly. I, I, so I looked at this and thought of the fact that um, maybe we could use this sort of in, in a reverse fashion. Uh, if someone were to get majorly wounded, especially during combat, I was in military science today, and we were talking about uh, medical procedures, basically, so I, I, I sort of thought of this during military science, uh, since I was constantly studying vitamins, trying to cram for this presentation today. So. <laughs> I thought of the fact that maybe we could use uh, vitamin E in sort of a chemical mix um, to put on wounds to, uh, well, I guess you wouldn't use vitamin E. You'd have something, you'd have to create a compound that would uh, reverse the effects to increase or stimulate cell proliferation. And then you could use some of the other vitamins like vitamin A and I believe vitamin D as well um, helps uh, increase the rate at which cells multiply uh, from a few of the things I read. And obviously there's some problems that you would run into while doing this, one of which would be vitamins like this have to go through a process to actually get into the cells. Uh, with modern advancements in, in medicine, I'm, I'm sure we could figure out some way to do this. We've already been able to make synthetic vitamins, which, are, which is really interesting. They're not as effective, so uh, if, if you want to be really healthy, eat, eat them from foods. Don't take pills. Just a fun fact. I was researching that today as well. So. <laughs> But considering we can do that, I'm sure we could find something that would allow us to um, 
basically put those uh, chemicals directly into the cells, which would stimulate mitosis, which would cause those cells to rapid, rapidly multiply and be able to heal much faster than normal cells would be able to. Um, another theme that I've been previously doing research into, because I'm really interested in biomechanical and biomedical engineering, was starfish stem cells. Starfish stem cells, the thing about them is uh, starfish can use their stem cells to regenerate almost any part of their body. We cannot. We can regenerate skin and a few other things, and that, that's about it. Um, but that's why starfish can live for so long, because they can constantly heal those parts of their body. So if we were able to find out what signals those starfish are sending to their stem cells, and if we're able to genetically implement it into our own bodies, we might be able to um, increase our lifespan and increase uh, our, our ability to heal, which would be especially useful for, useful for uh, soldiers during war. We could use the, ser the serum in conjunction with this to rapidly heal even bullet wounds inside the body, piercing places like the heart, the liver, the gut, because we'd be able to have those stem cells uh, turn into those, uh, the corresponding cells and healing at a much more rapid rate, which I think would be really amazing. So, um, another thing about vitamin E is it acts as a free radical scavenger, which basically means that it can destroy bad cells, like cancer, for example. One thing, another thing we could use vitamin E, uh, if we did enough research on it and found out how exactly it goes about this, we could possibly create some sort of organism, uh, something natural, that we could put into people with cancer and have it take care of the problem much more rapidly than this is because the issue with vitamin E is as you start to overdose on it because uh, it's a fat soluble vitamin so that means you can overdose on it because it isn't washed out through the kidneys like water soluble vitamin is um, it means that well once you overdose on it basically it can cause uh, veins and arteries to swell up uh, because it causes irritation to the inside the inner lining of them basically um, I thought of two well I thought of one interesting thing about this, if we were to put the uh, excess amounts of vitamin E into the solution and find a way for them to not inhibit the cell proliferation, which would be very difficult. So if we were able to um, isolate it and have it only cause the, um, the overdose effects, we could have uh, the vitamin itself stop the wound from bleeding, as opposed to having to uh, have soldiers constantly carrying tourniquets on them or pressure bandages, which would be really amazing. It would be revolutionary to just be able to uh, keep a pack with you with this serum in it and someone gets wounded and you put the serum on, it increases the rate of mitosis and uh, it stops the bleeding altogether. And so you can, uh, as, as my teacher said, you can continue returning fire. Um, I think that's all I have for today. Thank you. Okay, and with that, that concludes our last competitor, so we will allow the judges 42 seconds to come up with their <laughs> findings and run on back out here. Um, if I could have the, if I could be organized, right? If I could have the English contestants, Aaron McLittle, Ulali DeSouza, Owen Dwyer, and Jackson Johnson, please all come up to the stage. Go ahead and stand there kind of in the middle by the screen. And then you get to stay up there the whole time so we can take pictures of the whole nine yards. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in fourth place tonight in the category of English, Aaron McLittle from North Valley High School. I apologize. Stay up here so we can take pictures and smile and we'll keep everybody up here as we announce all the other categories as well. In third place, from Grants Pass High School, Jackson Johnson. In second place, from Illinois Valley High School, Owen Dwyer. And in first place, from Hidden Valley High School, Olali DeSouza.
congratulations to all of you. And I, and I would like to add, just being here means that you are the best from your school to, to come forward. So very proud of all of you and your efforts tonight. If I could have you guys slide down a little bit as the next group comes up, I would like the math participants to come up. If we could have Raina Fusen, Lucas Simchuk, Owen Pickering, and Daniel Beachy please come to the stage. Thank you. In fourth place from Illinois Valley High School, Raina Fusen. In third place from North Valley High School, Owen Pickering. In second place from Hidden Valley High School, Daniel Beachy. And in first place, from Grants Pass High School, Lucas Simchuk. If we can now have the social studies contestants come up. Kelly Bell, Eric Whitmore, Joseph Gerson, and Jonathan Wood. In fourth place in social studies, from Hidden Valley High School, Joseph Gerson. In, in third place, from Illinois Valley High School, Jonathan Wood. Second place, from North Valley High School, Eric Whitmore. And in first place, from Grants Pass High School, Kelly Bell. If we could have the music contestants of Charlie Jarvis, Annie Hurtler, Grace Henry, and Caitlin Newen come up. Category of music in fourth place from North Valley High School, Caitlin Nguyen. In third place from Hidden Valley High School, Grace Henry. In second place from Illinois Valley High School, Annie Hurtler. And our winner tonight, first place in music from Grants Pass High School, Charlie Jarvis. And the science judges took more than 42 seconds. So if you would like to get up and take any pictures right now while we calculate all of their SAT scores combined for the math question next year, feel free to do so while we're waiting. And I will jump back to the, uh, on the page for the Academic Master's Final Results, there is a tax-deductible donation pledge with name, address, phone number, and amount of donation, and then you're able to mail that into the Academic Master's Foundation. And once again, members of the Foundation, thank you so much for being here tonight to support this and help us put this on.
Okay, and thank you to our science judges for working so quickly. I was sort of joking. Um, if I could have the science contestants, Aria Back, Danny Scheinrock, Mark Smolinski, and Chris DeLong, please come up. Thank you. In fourth place, oh, I'm so sorry. In fourth place in the science uh, competition from Hidden Valley High School, Aria Back. In third place from North Valley High School, Chris DeLong. In second place from Illinois Valley High School, Danny Scheinrock. And in first place from Grants Pass High School, Mark Smolinski. The school team that is the overall winner gets an additional $250. And the standings go as such. In fourth place for the 2019 Academic Masters, North Valley High School. Third place, Hidden Valley High School. Second place, Illinois Valley High School. And the winner of the 2019 Academic Masters, for school is Grants Pass High School. The participation winner for um, most tickets put into jars, and we may have to recount this because I had some of my students working out there, but the participation winner is Illinois Valley High School. So participants, if you would bear with your parents and other people if we could take a few more pictures before you jump down or jump into teams. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming to Illinois Valley High School. Please drive safely.